Hello and welcome to today's presentation by my Solo 401k Financial. In today's webinar, we'll be going through some very important compliance do's and don'ts related to Solo 401k plans. My name is George Blower. I'm the principal and general counsel of my Solo 401k Financial. In today's presentation, we won't be giving any legal advice, tax advice, nor investment advice. Instead, our focus will be educational. So let's get started. On this first slide, we'll give an overview of the topics that we, we, we will be going over. Again, this will be important do's and don'ts related to solo 401k plans. We'll first be going through important topics related to account opening and account setup. Then we'll discuss rollovers, contributions, distributions, loans, investing in real estate, and finally, important filing, reporting, and deadline topics. So let's get started. Under account opening and setup, the first thing that you want to do is confirm that you are self-employed. This is a very important threshold topic as in order to set up and qualify for a solo 401k, you need to be self-employed. In the words of the IRS, if you look at their guidance in IRS publication 560, they shed some light on what that means. It essentially boils down to making money off of your personal effort. So common examples of self-employment activity would include serving as a consultant, perhaps an attorney, or providing some other type of professional services, maybe a realtor. All of these are common examples of what would be considered to be self-employment activity. Examples that are not self-employment would be having a W-2 job where you re receive income on, on a W-2. In that instance, you're not self-employed, rather you're an employee. In addition to being self-employed, in order to qualify to set up a solo 401k, you cannot have any full-time W-2 employees. So full-time for purposes of this discussion is going to be someone who's working at least a thousand hours or more. So if you have W-2 employees working for you that are working at least a thousand hours or more, you are not going to be eligible, eligible to set up a solo 401k. Of course, if you are working with 1099 independent contractors, that won't preclude you from establishing a solo 401k. When you set up a solo 401k, you do want to adopt an IRS-approved qualified 401k plan. And you'll know this because your provider should provide you with a favorable determination letter from the IRS which confirms that the plan that's been established meets the requirements to be a 401k. Now you need to open up an account where the money that will be contributed or rolled over to the plan will be held. This account needs to be at a financial institution, such as a bank or a brokerage. These could be your local bank, it could be a national bank such as Wells Fargo. In addition to that, there are a number of brokerage firms that will open up accounts in the name of the solo 401k, such as Fidelity and Schwab, just to name a couple. Our company, for instance, works for many, many different works with many, many different financial institutions. But those are some popular examples. When you open up the account, you don't want to open it up in your name, but instead it needs to be opened up in the name of the solo 401k. Moreover, you don't want to open up the account using your business or personal tax ID. Instead, you'll need to open up that account in an EIN that's been obtained from the IRS specifically for that solo 401k. And a good practical reason for that is because if there is any type of income that's reported with respect to that account, 
say for instance that the account is earning interest and a 1099 INT is issued for that interest income. Well, that interest is being earned on a 401k, so that's generally going to be tax deferred. And so if that account was opened up in, opened up in your name or perhaps in your business name, then the IRS would likely be looking for that interest income on your business or tax return by having it, having the account in the name, in the EIN of the 401k, the IRS is going to know that this is, this income is being earned on a tax deferred entity, such as a 401k. When you open up those sub accounts for the 401k, you're not going to want to combine pre-tax and Roth money. Instead, you need to open up two sub accounts. One would be for the pre-tax money and another would be for the Roth money because it's very important to keep those pre-tax and post-tax dollars segregated. And finally, in opening up and setting up a solo 401k, you don't want to combine funds for spouses in a single sub account. It's going to make your life much easier for tracking purposes or if some other uh, situation were to arise, such as a death or divorce, if spouses' funds are kept in separate sub-accounts. So, for example, you might have one bank account in the name of the plan for the benefit of the husband, and then a second bank account in the name of the plan for the benefit of the wife. And then going further, if both individuals have both pre-tax and Roth money, then each individual would have two accounts. So you could have four accounts that are set up for a single solo 401k plan. So let's move on to rollovers. When you transfer funds from a pre-existing retirement account to a solo 401k, it's going to be important to follow specific procedures. For example, if you're rolling over from an IRA, you do want to transfer the funds as a direct rollover. You don't want to transfer the funds as an indirect rollover. And the reason for that stems from some relatively recent regulatory guidance indicating that you could only do one indirect rollover regardless of the number of IRA accounts that you have per 12 month period. If you do more than one, it's going to be considered to be a distribution. So you want to roll that money over as a direct rollover. So when you're working with your provider or the existing, uh, the, entity, the entity that holds that existing IRA, you want to make sure that you're indicating that the money is being transferred to a qualified 401k employer plan so that they know how to report it. When you're transferring from a former employer plan, similar, similarly, you want to do that as a trustee to trustee transfer. So that's similar to a direct rollover, except that's for a former employer plan. You're transferring those funds as a trustee to trustee transfer. You do want to confirm that a 1099R with the code G in box seven is issued for the transfer because this transfer is a reportable event, but it's not a taxable event. So by issuing that 1099R with the code G in box seven, that indicates to the IRS that the transfer was not taxable. In other words, that the money went to another retirement plan. You do want to confirm that the transfer check is payable to the solo 401k. So oftentimes when you initiate that transfer, the transferring institution is going to transfer those funds via check. And so you want to make sure that you let them know to make the check payable to the solo 401k rather than making it payable to you personally. Again, you don't want to transfer funds as an indirect rollover. You don't want to deposit the transfer check in your business or personal account because that's going to look like a distribution. Again, you're just transferring over it over to the, to another retirement account in this case, a solo 401k. So the funds need to go directly to that, solo 401k account. You don't want to transfer funds from a Roth IRA into a solo 401k. Because of the IRA rules, you cannot transfer money from a Roth IRA to a 401k. 
you could transfer Roth 401k funds, but not Roth IRA funds. And the reason for that comes down to there are different uh, distribution rules. There's different ways that the five-year period is calculated for IRA versus uh, 401k, Roth 401k accounts. So you're not going to be able to move those funds. And again, that's because of the IRA rules. You don't want to transfer pre-tax funds directly to a Roth solo 401k. So if your 401k plan, your solo 401k plan, allows you to have Roth funds, such as our plan, and you're looking to put money into that Roth sub-account, where the money is going to be coming from an existing pre-tax retirement account, such as, such as a traditional IRA, the funds need to go through a two-step process. They're first going to go from the pre-tax existing account to the new pre-tax sub-account under the solo 401k, and then they would be converted from the pre-tax sub-account under the solo 401k to the Roth account. And obviously your provider is going to need to take care of the required reporting and that's going to be a taxable event. But you do want to make sure that the money flow is consistent where it goes from a pre-tax to a pre-tax and then to the Roth sub-account. So let's go on and talk about contributions. This is another key topic. And under, under contributions, the first and basic concept anytime you're talking about contributions is you want to make those contributions based on your self-employment income. A key takeaway is you're, that you're never going to be able to make contributions in excess of your self-employment income. Even though the overall limit that applies to you might be 53000 or 59000 for 2016 based on your age, if you don't have sufficient self-employment income, you're not going to be able to max out those contributions. In determining your self-employment income, you do want to aggregate from all sources of self-employment income. So if you are in a position where you have multiple sources of self-employment income, for example, you might be a realtor and you might also have some other business as well so that you've got multiple sources of self-employment income. Well, you need to aggregate those sources of self-employment income in determining how much you can contribute. You do want to confirm that the plan, the solo 401k plan was adopted by December 31st of your first contribution year. So when you make contributions, you, the deadline to do that is actually when, the, when your tax return is due. So if you're taxed as a sole proprietorship and you're reporting that self-employment income on your personal tax return on Schedule C, you know, your tax return, of course, is due in April. So you actually have up until April or even later if you file a timely extension to make those contributions for the previous year, say for 2015. But you would have need to have had adopted the plan by December 31st of 2015 if you want to make those contributions in the following year. Do consider any contributions made to your W-2 employer sponsored plan. So you might be in a situation where you have a W-2 day job and you're participating in your W-2 employer sponsored plan and you're making contributions. You could be say maxed out, putting in $18,000 if you're under 50 to your W-2 employer sponsored plan. Well, you're still gonna, if you have self-employment income, you're still gonna be able to make contributions to the solo 401k, but you'll have to consider those contributions made to your employer sponsored plan. So in terms of making contributions to a solo 401k, you're able to make two types. You're able to make both employee contributions as well as employer. So the employee limit, if you're under 50 is $18,000. And that the, the contributions you make to any other plan are going to be ag aggregated. And the reason for that is that the employee limit of applies at the employee level. So it's going to consider plans made to, or contributions made to all plans that you're participating in. So if you're maxed out under your employer-sponsored plan, 
you won't be able to make any more employee contributions, but you could still make employer contributions to your solo 401k plan. Next, you're not going to be able or you don't want to make any contributions in excess of the contribution limits. So again, you're going to, there's multiple factors to consider. One is age, another is your self-employment income. Another is how the business is being taxed. And then, of course, you have the overall contribution limits of 53 and 59,000. So you want to make sure that you factor all that in and don't make contributions in excess of the contribution limits. You don't want to make contributions in, in excess of your self-employment income. As we, we've been discussing, a fundamental concept is you're not able to make contributions higher than your actual self-employment income. And of course, you're not going to be able to make contributions based on your W-2 wages if you have a day job. You can only make contributions, again, based on your self-employment income. You don't want to deposit Roth contributions in the pre-tax sub-account. So you might be in a position where you're making Roth contributions to a solo 401k. It's going to be important to deposit those contributions in the Roth sub-account rather than the pre-tax account. You don't want to make contributions after your tax return deadline, including extensions. So again, as long as you set up the plan by December 31st, you're going to be able to make contributions for that year all the way up until the tax return is due for your business, including any timely filed, timely filed extensions. But of course, you're not going to be able to make contributions after that deadline. Okay, so let's go on to distributions. So when, when you take a distribution from a 401k, there's going to be a mandatory withholding, a 20% mandatory withholding. So that mandatory withholding tax needs to be paid by the 15th of the following month. So you do want to make sure you pay it by the 15th of the following month. It's going to be sent directly to the IRS. You do need to file Form 945 by January 31st of the following year to report that withholding. So you want to make sure you do that. A 1099-R will need to be filed by February of the following year as well. And oftentimes the 401k provider will handle that. For example, we handle that for our clients. You do want to confirm that a Roth distribution is qualified. So typically that's going to mean holding that or having made that uh, Roth contribution, the initial one, at least five years prior to the distribution and then being at least 59 and a half before you take that distribution. Otherwise, that distribution will be taxable, which of course defeats the whole purpose of setting up a Roth in the first place. When you take a distribution and pay the mandatory withholding, you don't want to use your personal or business tax ID. You're going to want to use the employer identification number that was obtained for the 401k plan during the establishment process. So you want to make sure you use the right tax ID number when paying that mandatory withholding tax. You don't want to distribute any employee or employer contributions if no qualifying event occurred, such as separation for, from employment or some type of hardship event. So you want to make sure you look at those rules before you distribute any employee or employee employer contributions made to the solo 401k. You don't want to fail to report the distribution on your personal income tax return. Of course, typically these, the distribution is going to be ta taxable. You know, if you're taking money that was pre-tax, so you put it in without paying tax, eventually you're going to have to pay tax on that money. So when you take that distribution, even if you're avoiding the penalty, it's typically always going to be taxable. Finally, you don't want to fail to pay the 10% penalty if applicable. So if you take that distribution before you're 59 and a half or there's no, and there's no hardship, you know, you're going to have to pay a 10% penalty. So it's going to be important to take care of that in connection with taking that distribution. Okay, great. So let's go on to do's and don'ts related to solo 401k loans. So the loans that we're we are referring to here are participant loans. These are loans that you are taking from your own plan. You know, you're borrowing, 
borrowing from your 401k. So if your 401k plan provides or supports loans, you can certainly do that, but you want to make sure you follow the rules because there are very specific steps to ensure that 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 loan is not going to be considered to be a taxable distribution. You do want to document the loan. That's one of the basic concepts. And oftentimes the provider will take care of that. For example, we handle all the loan documentation requirements for no additional charge for our clients. You do want to make payments on a monthly or quarterly basis. So when you're paying back that loan, you need to do it either on a monthly or quarterly basis. You're going to be paying principal and interest. So you do need to pay a reasonable interest rate. And of course, you want to deposit those loan payments in the solo 401k account. So it's going to be that bank or the brokerage account that you set up for the plan at the beginning of the process. You don't want to take a loan in excess of the limit, including multiple loan rules. So the limit that applies is going to be 50%, not to exceed $50,000. So if you've got $100,000 in your plan, then you're going to be able to take a $50,000 loan. If you've got $150,000, you're still only going to be able to take a $50,000 loan. Now, in determining that, you want to make sure that you consider the multiple loan rules. Of course, if you have multiple loans out or an existing loan out and you've already, take, you've already you know, borrowed the limit, you're not going to be able to borrow any more money from your plan. Another thing to consider is the 12-month look-back rule. So let's say you took a $50,000 loan, you had $100,000 in your plan, and then you paid it back with, within six months. So you paid it back early. Well, you're not going to be able to turn around and take another $50,000 loan the next month. And the reason for that is the 12-month look-back rule. So essentially, that rule looks, has you look back to the prior 12 months to see what the highest outstanding balance was. And if you've already maxed out in the prior 12 months, you're not going to be able to take another loan until, you, until more time goes by. You don't want to take a loan without first obtaining required loan documents. So as I mentioned, one of the basic requirements is that the loan needs to be documented. So you want to make sure that you're first documenting the loan before you're taking it. You don't want to fail to report a loan default as a distribution. So if you're not able to make those loan payments back to the plan, that's going to be considered to be a distribution and you need to follow the, the rules that apply to any distribution and, of course, pay any applicable taxes and penalties. You don't want to set a term longer than five years unless the loan is used to purchase a primary residence. So the standard term is going to be five years. So those monthly or quarterly payments of principal and interest are going to be spread out over five years. The one exception where you're, you're able to uh, set a longer term is if you're using the loan to purchase a primary residence. Of course, it's going to be very important to, to fit right within that exception where you're able to get a longer term. So in other words, you've got to use the funds to purchase. So if you've already got an existing residence and you're simply looking to refinance your, say, existing bank loan, by borrowing money and then paying off that bank loan, you're not using those funds to purchase your primary residence. You're not able to set a longer term. Or if you're, even if you are purchasing um, real estate or a residence, if it's not your primary residence, you're still not able to set a longer term and you'll have to go with a five-year term. If you do fit within the exception, you can set a longer term and you could peg it to the length of an, an existing mortgage on that on that property. So say you have a 30 year mortgage, you could actually extend the, the term of that solo 401k loan all the way out to 30 years and really lower those payments. Okay, great. So let's go on to real estate because that is one of the most common reasons that people set up these um, solo 401k plans. They're looking to diversify their 401k investments and invest in real estate. So it's going to be important to follow the rules that apply to real estate investing. 
So one of the fundamental rules is you do want to purchase the property in the name of the solo 401k plan. So the title is not going to be in your name. It's not going to be in your business name. It needs to be in the name of the plan. You do want to deposit the proceeds from that real estate investment in the solo 401k account. So let's say that you've invested in a rental property. Well, that rental stream of income needs to go back to the solo 401k account. So your renter's checks will, will be deposited, say, in the bank account that you set up at the beginning of the process for the plan. Now, if you're buying property and you're looking to use debt, you can do that within the confines of the rules. So the debt that's used to buy the property cannot be conventional financing. Instead, it needs to be non-recourse financing. So what non-recourse financing means in simple terms is that the only recourse of the lender is going to be the collateral itself. In other words, if the loan is not paid back, they could go and uh, foreclose on the property, but they're not going to be able to go after any money that remains in your solo 401k. So it's not going to be like a standard conventional mortgage on someone's personal residence, where if you don't pay back that mortgage, you know, the bank will take your home, then they'll turn around and sue you for the difference after they sell that home and apply it to the balance. So this, in, in a solo 401k, in this, the case of a solo 401k, it has to be non-recourse financing. And of course, because of the nature of the financing, the terms are going to be very different, right? They're going to require more money down. Oftentimes the lender will have a shorter term or maybe a higher rate because of the nature of the financing. You do want to consider UBIT. So what that refers to is unrelated business income tax. And so that tax would apply if your 401k is invested in a business. And the, and the business is taxed as a pass-through entity. And so when you apply that concept of UBIT to real estate, there is a notion that it could apply to a 401k that's invested in flips. So if you're buying fix and flips and you're doing such a volume of fix and flips through your 401k, that could be deemed to be a business. And so there is a thought that the IRS could apply UBIT to that investment. So if you are doing <clears throat> a number of fix and flips, you're going to want to consult with your tax advisor to consider any UBIT implications and whether that income, which you would normally think is going to be tax deferred, is actually going to be subject to tax. You don't want to pay for expenses related to your real estate investment for personal funds, with personal funds. So just like, just like the proceeds from the investment needs to flow back to your 401k account, you need to pay for expenses out of that account. You know, again, go back to the simple concept of a rental. You know, the toilet breaks or it needs to be painted. You need to pay for those um, expenses out of your 401k account. You don't want to use the property for personal use or, or personal benefit. So if it's again a rental and it's empty and your relatives are in town, you don't want to let them stay there um, or you use it for your own personal use. You also don't want to use it for your personal benefit. So let's say that you are setting up a solo 401k as a realtor and you're self-employed. So you qualify, you invest in real estate. Well, if you go to sell that investment, you don't want to act as the realtor and get a commission off the sale of that investment. That's going to be uh, deemed as you personally benefit, benefiting from the investment of your retirement money, which is against the rules. You don't want to work on the property, so no sweat equity. So you might be somebody who likes to do it yourself, or you might have that skill set where you are able to fix properties up. So if you're investing in real estate through your solo 401k, you want to make sure that you don't work on the property. So if the toilet breaks or it needs to be painted, you're going to need to hire somebody else. You're going to have to hire a contractor to take care of that work. And you don't want to buy or sell properties from disqualified persons. So you, you wouldn't want to buy a your dad's property from your 401k or sell it to your spouse or from yourself. So when you're buying and selling properties, 
you want to make sure that you only transact with unrelated or disqualified persons, un undisqualified persons, third parties, that is. Okay, so let's go on to the final slide where we're going to go over uh, important filing, reporting, and deadline concepts. So if the balance of the solo 401k exceeds $250,000, you need to file a 5500EZ. And again, oftentimes the provider will take care of this. So for example, we prepare 5500EZs for our clients for no additional charge um, if the balance exceeds $250,000 because that's when the 5,500 filing requirement would kick in. You do want to adopt a 401k plan by December 31st of the year of the first contribution. So again, this goes back to our contribution discussion. So if you're going to make contributions for a specific year, the plan would have need to have been adopted by December 31st of that year. You do want to report any distributions on a 1099R by February of the following year. So, so again, just highlighting this important deadline. If you take a distribution, that is going to be a reportable event as well as a taxable event, and it gets reported on a 1099-R. Oftentimes, the provider of the plan will handle this reporting requirement, such as, such as with our plans. We handle preparing the filing those 1099-Rs. You do need to file Form 945 by January 31st of the year following any distribution. So again, that's to report the withholding that was paid um, with respect to that distribution. You don't want to fail to report any Roth conversion on the 1099-R. So if you move money from a pre-tax sub-account under your solo 401k to a Roth account, that's going to be a taxable event. It's also going to be a reportable event. It needs to be, re be reported on, uh, 1099, on a 1099R, again, by February of the following year. So don't fail to report any rollover on a 1099R with a code G in box 7. So this could be a rollover from a pre-existing account, in which case the, the existing financial institution, so say it's an IRA at Vanguard, they'll handle that 1099R reporting if you're rolling it over to a solo 401k because it's even though it's not a taxable event it is going to be a reportable event and so that would be issued with a, a code g in box seven similarly if you are transferring money from your solo 401k to say another account like an ira well your solo 401k provider needs to report that transfer on a 1099r with a code g in box seven so that's something that we would handle um, as part of our services, so you'd want to check with your provider on that. Don't make contributions after your tax return deadline, including extensions. So again, one of the benefits of a solo 401k is you're able to make contributions all the way up until the tax return deadline for your business. And, you know, again, assuming you've set up that plan by December 31st. So while you have that additional time, you want to make sure that you're making the contributions before the deadline. So that would be the tax return deadline for your business, including any timely filed extensions. And finally, if you make excess contributions, you are able to remove and correct those contributions, those excess contributions, but you need to make sure that you remove them um, by April 15th. So don't remove those excess contributions after April 15th of the following year. So that concludes our uh, webinar today, going over some important compliance do's and don'ts related to solo 401k plans. We do appreciate everyone's uh, attendance and taking time to view the webinar. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We've got our contact information here at 1-800-489-7571, or you can email us at info at mysolo401k.net or you can email me directly at george at mysolo401k.net. Thank you.